The spirit of the beehive has received critical response from around the world. But still, I wonder sometimes why this film has endured, why it continues to haunt the imagination of so many film goers and film critics and film scholars around the world. Derek Malcolm, who's a reviewer for The Guardian, has written that The Spirit of the Beehive is perhaps a film that we'll never understand fully, but we also will never completely forget. Victor Arice has written that he wanted to make the film to show how a child looks at the world, how a child understands history, how children construct their own narratives, what children need to do to feel empowered. In many ways, all the child can understand is that there's certain things that shouldn't be spoken about. Of course, the major character in the film is Anna. She's about six or seven years old. She's played by a child of the same age. And this little girl carries the entire film. It's an outstanding performance. I know that when he was making The Spirit of the Beehive, he was quite concerned about the little girl because she was not really performing. She was living the role, and she's asked to become immersed in some rather traumatic moments in the story. And he has written that now and then he calls Anna Tarrant on the phone just to make sure that she's okay, because he was worried that being in the spirit of the beehive might have shortened her childhood a little bit. The little actress' reaction to seeing Frankenstein was the actual first time that she did see this image. She's not performing. She is truly surprised at what she's seeing on the screen. And Victor Arise has written that this is the most exciting moment for him in all of his filmmaking career, because it really is a moment of recording reality. So who is in the family? We have the father, Fernando. We have the mother, Teresa. We have the older sister, Isabel, and the younger sister, Anna. And they actually are played by actors of the same first name. Now, Isabel, the older daughter, is about 10 years old. And she is performed by Isabel Teheria. Some people have written about her that she is really the truly monstrous character in the film. That she is then a symbol of um, how women are repressed and how women are, are trained to be a certain way within a patriarchy. She certainly has a very active imagination and a kind of dark imagination. I think that people come down kind of hard on Isabel, but this is the way we do see her in the film. She has a certain darkness that surrounds her. And in the very last scene, she is no longer sleeping in the children's room. She no longer sleeps next to Anna, who is traumatized and is sleeping for hours and hours. And I'm wondering if maybe by the very end, if she hasn't moved out of childhood completely. Fernando and Teresa are both, in a way, like a kind of vacuum. They're just empty. We don't know much about them, and we don't know any more about them if we read the screenplay, by the way. This is the way they were intended to be projected. They are, they are representatives of the adult Spaniard following Franco's rise to power. Fernando is a beekeeper, and the first time we see him, he's actually more frightening than the first image of the monster that we see in the film. We see him with this hood, and he looks like someone from another planet, really. Now, a beekeeper has a lot of powers, and so does the father, but they are not unlimited powers. He's very much, as Peter Evans, the scholar, has said, the creator and the captive of the beehive. Some people write about the similarity in the names Fernando and Franco and Frankenstein. But I think we have to keep in mind that this role is performed by the great actor Fernando Fernan Gomez, who is known for roles that project a sense of humanism and love. And I don't think that we should 
go too far in that direction of thinking of the father as an image of Frankenstein or of a dictator. However, there are moments when in Anna's kind of confused search to understand, she does equate her father with Frankenstein. And certainly in the scene where we see the two little girls whispering in the bed, and they're talking about Frankenstein, and then we hear the footsteps overhead, and we see that that's the father. We can see that in Anna's mind, this is becoming a little bit confused. When we think of a word monster, we think of something grotesque or terrible. But actually, to Anna, and, it, and in the original novel by Mary Shelley, the monster could be a friend. Okay, he looks grotesque, but he could be a friend. And I think this is the way that Anna, who's very much alone with her own vision, perceives of the monster. Anna wants to understand what is good and what is bad. She wants to be able to identify things. We see this in the scene with the mushroom. And she's not so good at identifying what the poisonous mushroom is. It has a sweet smell. It has a kind of disguise. But Anna wants to see through these disguises. She has an amazing ability to live in the unknown. Victor Arice has called that una suerte de misterio. It's very hard to place this film into any one genre. It certainly draws on the horror film genre. Victor Arice has written that the film was inspired by films like Murnau's Nosferatu and other films by the German Expressionists. He's also been highly influenced by Japanese filmmakers like Mizoguchi Kenji or Ozu Yasujiro. And you might notice how the camera will linger on a room when it's empty. And that's very much a technique that Ozu uses. Why would he choose this kind of filmmaking? Why not make a film that is a little bit clearer in terms of its storyline? And I think one reason is that when you're trying to depict images of trauma, this fragmented style of narration provides more of a sense of catharsis, more of an, a, a sense of being able to mourn the historical event than a straight narrative would. And Hayden White writes, telling a story, however truthful, about such traumatic events might very well provide a kind of intellectual mastery over the anxiety. But precisely insofar as the story is identifiable as a story, it can provide no lasting psychic mastery of such events. Modernist techniques of representation clear the way for that process of mourning, which alone can relieve the burden of history. Let's remember that it's set in the early 1940s in the years following a terribly divisive civil war in Spain, when a dictator, General Francisco Franco, was in power for life. It ended up being more than 35 years of a dictatorship. The film was made in the early 70s, when Franco was still in power. I think that a lot of the images of the Spanish Civil War and its aftermath are centered in this character, the fugitive. Unfortunately, he is shown as mute in the same way that the monster in the James Wales film of Frankenstein is mute. So it's a little hard for us to read into the great dignity of the Maquis of the freedom fighters through this figure. The Italian novelist Alberto Moravia, in his review of this film, calls the fugitive a political monster for, the, for Franco. And I think that that's an accurate way to read him. Now, after he dies, we see his dead body. And it's laid out rather unceremoniously in this town hall. In fact, one shoe is missing. In many ways, it's the same position as the monster before he's finished by 
Dr. Frankenstein. Let me talk a little bit about the setting, because I think that the different settings are really, in many ways, protagonist. We have the small town of Oyuelos, and the village is a microcosm of the entire nation. It is a village that's closed in upon itself, as I mentioned. It has very few connections to the outside world. The town hall becomes a movie theater, and then later it becomes a kind of makeshift funeral hall. And all of the spaces have this sense of transformation to them. Victor Arice has written about the makeshift movie theaters of his youth as a kind of refuge, as a place where he could feel connected to the world. It wasn't very easy to get a passport at that period when Franco was in power. People, the Spaniards couldn't travel abroad, but he felt he could travel by going and seeing these movies that were brought into the village reel by reel in the same way. The inside of the house has a very warm palette, yellows and oranges. In some ways, it's like painting by Vermeer, the Dutch master. But you can tell that the house has almost no furnishings inside. This is a middle-class family, but these are hard times. They don't have much to eat. You notice it's just a, a bowl of milk for breakfast, for example. And needless to say, the most wonderful note are these, um, these windows, these beehive windows that have a kind of honey-colored light that comes through it, and special filters were used to produce this, this honey color in the light. The house also has within it images of entrapment. We see the bars that are behind Teresa as she's sleeping. But then we have these great sort of wild areas, the, the expanse of the Castilian Plain and the woods where these poisonous mushrooms can be found, and the lake where Anna sees a reflection of Frankenstein. Only Anna is really open to the great outside spaces. She's the only one who goes out to explore because she has a, a strong desire to find this Frankenstein figure. There's also the shed, the abandoned shed in the field. And one scholar has pointed out that it's somewhat like a stage from Spanish um, Siglo de Oro plays. And in fact, the girls always enter from a certain door, just as you would if you were an actor, except for the very last scene where Anna comes back, and then she enters from a different door. And at this point, we feel that things are starting to unwind in her world. So I've spoken about the honey light um, coming through the windows. We also should mention about shadows. Certainly when Anna goes out, and wanders at night. There's a clouded moon and uh, many shadows. And there's also the, the wonderful scene of the hand puppetry, the shadow puppetry, which of course was a precursor of the cinema. We can still find this kind of shadow puppetry in countries like Indonesia or Turkey or China, but it was known in France as well. Another aspect of the lighting is when we see the audience during the projecting of Frankenstein especially when we see the two girls, their faces are white against a black background, against the darkness, very much like a figure in a painting by the Spanish Baroque painter Francisco de Zurbarán. And I know that Zurbarán is one of uh, Victor Dice's favorite painters. Another use of lighting is the image of fire. We, we see a scene that is actually drawn from a midsummer rite called the Noche de San Juan, the night of St. John, and this is when the little girls are jumping over the flames. And then later, we see the villagers going through the forest looking for Anna, carrying torches, because of course she has disappeared and it's, it's late at night. This scene very much echoes the scene in James Whale's film, Frankenstein, when the villagers are searching for the monster. How can we interpret the ending of The Spirit of the Beehive? The actual last time we hear Anna's voice is at the breakfast table, and then she enters into a long period of silence. We hear her again just at the very ending when she announces her name again, seemingly out to the universe.
ultimately the monster that Anna sees before her, the monster who has both frightened and enticed her, becomes part of her own name. She turns at the end and she faces back into her room. She can move between the ephemeral and the concrete, between the spirit and the beehive.